Yo, what is good, Dev guys? It's your boy Kane. Yes, sir, I'm back with another devlog. Let's go ahead and jump right into the features that I added for this month. In the last devlog, I spoke about using a Fortnite style customization system where players could equip pre made skin. I decided on that based on a fear that with the modular approach, players will run into meshes not lining up or, even worse, not looking good with one another. I've gone back to the drawing board and reverted back to letting players have full creative freedom over their characters. This was one of, if not the most time consuming part of this month, so let's jump into the editor and see the fruits of that labor. So if I come over here and jump into the customize tab, I have these subsections that fit within the section that you're in. So each section has its own amount of subsections that you can edit. There's a lot of editing choices and there's a lot more assets I need to add to this system to make it more complete. But for the time being, this is what I have. So you can edit the colors of the skin. You can be whatever color you choose. In this case, I'm gonna go with the teal. You can edit the hair color. Uh, this is actually for the hair meshes, but you can edit the hair color, which we do have since we have eyebrows. And you can go ahead and select whatever color you want for the eyebrows. You can also right click on the layer and clear the shader. So here, if I right click on these two layers that I added a color to, it revert it back to white. In this case, I do want to be teal and I do want these eyebrows to be green. For the heads, this is where I actually have some meshes. So I'm using head one. This is the only mesh that I put through my pipeline. The rest of them have not been put through my pipeline. The art pipeline is probably the most time consuming part of this whole system. I'll go into more detail about that in a second. So I'm going to just, you know, show off that you can right click and get rid of the, the mesh that you select as well. Uh, let's change the eye color. Let's do... Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, that looks good. We don't have any beards yet or we don't have any facial markings yet, but we can go into the chest section and we can change to a long sleeve or a turtleneck or we can even go back shirtless. And each one of these parts, you can go in and change the color. But in this case, for meshes that apply a shader, you can actually apply a custom shader here. So if I, if I want to, I can apply this aqua blue or cool blue shader here or I can do this uh, red October shader here that is uh, a little bit different than this one previous. And then this shader is applied to this layer. So if I go in and I change to the long sleeve, I'll have that shader applied to this layer. So going in, you can, you know, you can go to your heart's content. You can go ahead and just stack these meshes on top of each other. Like I said in there, you can also go in and change the shaders of everything. I actually want to change the shader of this t-shirt. So I am going to change that to cool blue. And you can see as long as I change the shader here, I change it for the entire layer. So let's go into the hands and let's give myself some gloves here. I only got one pair of gloves. Go ahead, give it the cool blue shader as well. And give us some pants because we butt naked out here maybe. Let's go with the yoga pants and I'm also give it the cool blue shader. And last but not least, we have the feet, which will have socks and shoes. I could go over what these layers are, but I'll just, you know, this it's not important since I don't have anything to show for it. So I'm just going to the layers that actually have stuff to show. So let me go to the low top shoes and we'll go to the cool blue shader as well. And so if I go back and exit out of this, you can see I can take a look at my overall character. And this is the now the customization that we will take into the play space. So if I just go back to the play button here and let's just go practice 3v3. And now you can see that all of my customization has transferred over. We have our skin color. We have all of our gear. We have our shoes, our gloves, and everything is here and in place. This also works with replication. So if I exit here, and I go to my workspace map where I can play a multiplayer. I'll run this as two clients. Now, in, the, in this case, both players will load up with the same colors and same layout, but this is only because the system loads from your save preferences on disk, and then it requests the server to give us those items. So I can go up to this dude, see his eyes. Uh, but yeah, you can see that the replication is there and everything looks cute. One of the biggest things I had to solve with the modular system using the original content was the amount of draw calls that each one of these meshes uses. If you don't know about draw calls, you can see that each one of these material IDs counts as a draw call when it comes down to it. 
if I'm letting players combine up to 15 meshes together and then each mesh has three draw calls, we're looking at 45 draw calls per player. Then when you push in the low end systems, those things are really important to think about. In order to fix that, I had to use Houdini. In Houdini, I have a pipeline that essentially bakes all of the original content down to a format that Houdini can read and write to. Once I get that content to a state that Houdini can read and write to, I then take it to a working section here and then I do anything I need to do to it. I change the UVs, I'll delete some topology that I don't need. I then give it a vertex color and then I export it again as a final version that I could use later on. Once I get that final version, I bring it over here and I essentially bake the normals from the original geometry back on to this newly created UV map. So one of the biggest issues that I was scared of was the fact that I would have to re-sculpt everything and do all this stuff. But with Houdini, there's this thing called the Maps Baker, and it has this option to transfer different maps on to a different UV channel. So I transferred the normal map from the original mesh onto my new UVs of the same mesh. Once that's done, another manual step is setting the mesh up to be exported out to both Substance Painter and Unreal. So I have to take this mesh, I have to merge it back with its skeleton. I do a little peak node here for certain things that sit on top of other layers since a lot of these meshes weren't really made to be separate. Like in, in an instance, you can see my t-shirt here is a separate closed piece. And in the original content, the t-shirt is a combination of a, the t-shirt and the arms. So this had two draw calls. I didn't want to deal with that. I also want the players to be able to wear a t-shirt whenever you want to wear a t-shirt. So this was not an option. So in order to fix the meshes clipping through one another, I had to add this peak node here that just, you know, ex it extrudes along the normals, essentially, if, if you think about another program. I give it the material so that it only has one material ID. This is essentially how you set it up with one material ID. And then you just give it some names. And essentially, you export this out as an FBX. And this is the same file that I use in both Unreal and Substance Painter. Speaking of Substance Painter, I imported it in and I made my own smart material here that automatically has these layers laid out for me. And I hand paint a material ID map. And this is where all of the shaders inside of the editor will get placed. So we take a look at the jacket, go to customize chest. The jacket has leather on the inside, leather on there, it has some metal here, and then the rest of it is blue denim. If I alter this mask to where maybe this color, or let's change this outside color to green. So if I change this mask and then export this out, once Unreal reads that my textures has changed, it imports it. And then I could go to the customization again, and we can see that that shader will automatically change because it's based on that material ID. So now I have a different material here on the outside and it looks a little cooler. This is actually pretty, this is a pretty dope layout of this. I might actually keep that. But this system is really fluid once it gets going. Uh, I only have a few parts right now, but once I spend some more time dealing with this side of the project, I will have a lot more parts already ready to go. Another addition to the project is AI. Since I haven't been able to test with a real player, AI is the next best thing. I implemented all of their logic using a newer feature in Unreal called State Trees. In my opinion, State Trees are the future of how you should implement gameplay behavior for AI. The ability to create tasks and states in both Blueprints as well as C++ makes it super familiar. Creating the behavior is more closely like writing the gameplay logic. If you're interested in learning more about state trees, I have a two hour long introduction tutorial on my channel that you can check out once you finish watching this video. Right now, let's see how my AI behaves. All right, so the AI live demo, let's hope I don't run into any bugs. You can see my AI aren't doing anything. That's because they don't have any logic running right now. They react based on the ball's possession changing. 
So if I pick the ball up, you can see the offensive players, they start running to the offensive side. The defensive players, they have these defensive assignments and they're trying to stay in front or around their defensive assignments. So you can see this guy is chasing my teammate over there with the icon. That, that icon is just to help the player know which icon will pass to who. Uh, since my game is skill based and, and not automatic, uh, but you can see that the defense is trying to keep up with the person that they're assigned to guard and that's selected randomly when the game starts. The AI also have a ball handler state. When they get the ball, they become a ball handler. They look for space to shoot the ball and then they shoot the ball. They also will pass the ball if they figure it's a better option to pass. Let me turn off this debugging so we can see. Right there, we just saw that the AI on the other team, since I scored, the possession of the game changed. So they're commanded to try to take out the ball and pass the ball in. You'll see this right now with my AI. Once the ball is scored, there's a message sent to the AI, hey, the ball scored. If you're on the other team, you need to take the ball out. So you can see here he passes the ball. And I can actually make this guy pass me the ball, but I made him pass that guy the ball. I made him pass me the ball. If I, if I press a pass key and the AI has the ball, they'll pass it to whoever's in the slot that I chose. Another demo is the shot caller events. So I have this shot caller system where I can pick the ball up and as long as I have the ball, I can call an offensive play. This also will work on defense when you're playing against another player, but I haven't implemented any defensive plays yet. But once I pick the ball up, I have the option to press my shot caller key and select a play. You can see that my AI starts moving to specific spots. This guy came back to me and this guy went to the corner over there. And once they get the ball, they once again, they become the ball handler. This dude is still running his pick and roll objective, which is not a bad thing. It's just that, yeah, that's probably something I need to look at in the future. And you can see that they take the ball out here. I'm going to let them score. And uh, ma matter of fact, I, I'll probably take the ball from this guy if I can hit him. Can we hit him? Can we hit him? There we go. We knocked the ball loose there. So now that I have the ball, let me actually show the debugging so you guys can see what the, the shot caller does. So if I call that same pick and roll play, you can see that this box spawns next to me. This is where the pick picks their position and the corner picks their position over there. And then once this guy does his pick, he runs to this other yellow position, but it kind of like scuffed itself because I, I had two up at the same time. But with the debugging, I could see what my team is trying to do offensively. But you can see, since that, that team was on offense, they started trying to spawn spots to play offensively. Let's just win the game. Once you win the game, you get a little stat line. It, it lets you know that you're victorious. You get a little stat line letting you know what your stats were. I just put some arbitrary stats in here. This just is like the post-game match. This is still like using Lyra stuff. And then once the game is over, you can either rematch or go back to the lobby. Here's a quick look at how my system kind of flows. So the start of the system is either a state tree event or a shot call event. So whenever you get one of these events, it essentially gets broken down to an event gameplay tag. This gameplay tag is then used to search the asset manager for these state tree behavior data containers. These look like this in the editor. So these hold a soft reference to the actual state tree that they are supposed to run whenever they get a message. This makes my system really modular in a way where I can send a lightweight message and then the AI will then sort out what they're supposed to do. So this works well for me instead of having a monolith of a behavior tree that I have to like have all these different tree nodes and things flowing. And instead I have a state tree that has its specific logic contained within it and if i need to edit that logic i just go to that object and edit that logic it's really modular it's really clean and i really like how stage trees has opened up ai programming for me so in the comment section of my last devlog as well as the comment section of my live streams there's been a lot of feedback from you guys one of the biggest things that you guys have been saying is that this game should be in third person. Now, I am a first person shooter only player. Like, I only play first person shooters. But after finding this camera, this Gears of War esque camera, I agree with you guys. Now, it's not only because you guys' suggestion that I did this, I was running into a lot of tech debt when it came to animations. 
And one of the things that I was going to have to do for each animation, I was going to have to make sure that that animation did not impede the first person perspective. I had to make sure that each animation looked good in the first person perspective. And that's a lot of work for one person. So zooming the camera back allows me to use animations, even though they don't look good in first person. Now, this lets me use marketplace animations, the Paragon animations, or just merge and animations together from different sources without having to think about how it looks in first person. So I'd say thank you guys for that suggestion. Now, even though I brushed it off when you first mentioned it, uh, after testing and finding that perfect camera view that fits right in between first person and third person, for me, this is like perfect, man. Uh, it, it really does look a lot better. Another thing I've done to make the game look a lot more, you know, centered or, or grounded is I have reduced the size of the basketball goals. It was also mentioned in the comments that the basketball goals were way too big and that that could actually make the game easier for players to hit shots. And, you know, I kind of brushed that one off too. But after moving this back to third person, I started, you know, I was busting ass. All right. It was too, the hole was way too big in third person. So reducing the goal to about 80% of its original size was all it needed to, to look a little bit better. Uh, I might go smaller if I do some more testing and see that it's a little bit easier to hit shots. But for now, this actually looks pretty good. So if you guys have any suggestions or any feedback that you want to give me, please leave it in the comment section. Please don't hesitate to jump into the live streams and tell me something about myself because I kind of remember all that stuff. And even though I might not pay attention to it while I'm working, uh, it does hit me in the back of my brain and let me know that somebody else is thinking about my game in a way that I'm not. So I always try to at least test the idea to see if it'll work. So Jump in the comment section. Let me know what you guys think. Okay, so those are all the updates I have for you guys this month. If you are interested in learning more about this game, be sure to jump into my streams. Man, I'm starting to stream back up this week. And also make sure you're in the Discord. I leave links to the unlisted streams in the Discord announcements channel so you guys can watch. Sometimes I do things that people want a tutorial over, and so I do it in the stream. So if you're interested in that, make sure you're in the Discord. And with that, I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.